Hi, everyone. Let's take a look at more organic chemistry. We're going to begin unit two, and we're going to look at ethers now and a couple other functional groups. So pull out the key concepts. We're looking at unit two, part one. And we'll start with the ether functional group. OK, so an ether, that's where you have an oxygen single bonded to two carbons, right? So that's the general shape of a ether functional group. And the common name is really logical. So it makes sense. I like this one. It's easy to remember. If an ether has two sets of carbons attached to the oxygen, then just name those two pieces, those two carbon groups, and construct the name that way. The format is simply um, the name of the alkyl group on one side, alkyl, um, short for alkane, kind of a nickname for alkane. Right, so there's patterns, right? So methane is the parent name, but methyl is like the nickname. It's like we have the, the CH3 group attached to the parent. Ethane's the parent, ethyl, YL ending, so forth. So alkane becomes alkyl, you get the drift. Anyways, back to the ether, naming them. One side's an alkane, name it with the nickname alkyl. The other side's an alkane, name it with an alkyl. And then identify the oxygen in the middle with the word ether. Nice. So what's the name of this ether or its common name? Well, the name of this group is methyl. The name of this group is ethyl. And then we got the oxygen in the middle, single bonds to two carbons. That's the ether functional group. Oh, put it in alphabet order. So then we got ethyl methyl ether. And if you're a stickler on these sort of things, I'm not, no points lost. There's supposed to be spaces in between all these. Later when we look at amines, the common names will follow the same format and no spaces. I don't know why. Anyways, that's why I don't take off points for minor spelling errors or um, forgetting commas or dashes or spaces. Um, what else? A couple of examples. We got one right here on our key concepts. We're looking at the condensed formula for the, I'll write it over here so you can see a little more clearly. Okay, so this is a condensed formula for an isopropyl group. We can break it down, show all the bonds like that, there's two methyl groups attached to one carbon. So that's what I got drawn here. There's a hydrogen. And then the carbon with its fourth bond is linked to the oxygen, to a methyl. Oh, yeah, so I already named this group. This one is isopropyl, right? Three carbons is propane, but when you connect it in the middle, the nickname is isopropyl. And then alphabetical order, and yes, we use the I in iso for, for, for alphabetizing. So this is simply isopropyl methyl ether. If you're wondering about sec butyl and tert butyl when it comes to alphabetizing, IUPAC says no. Um, tert butyl, sec butyl, and butyl are all kind of like tied with the letter B, but I guess you break the tie using the S of sec and the T of tert. It's annoying. I won't take points off for that. If you have, if you alphabetize sec butyl and tert butyl differently from my UPAC. Let's see what else you need to know about common names. Oh, what about phenyl and benzyl? Um, we got isopropyl, that's an oddball, the sec butyl and the tert butyl. But yeah, you could, um, yeah. This name. This ether. Come on, hexagons. Okay, so there's the ether oxygen. It's linked to a carbon that's also linked to the benzene ring. And you'll remember from a previous video, last unit, that's the benzyl group. And if you have a normal benzene ring, it's not called benzyl, it's called phenyl. Alphatizes, the P comes after the B. So yeah, this is benzyl, phenyl, ether. Nice. Do I need any more? Oh. 
get ready. One more idea. If the same group appears twice, like it does in this molecule, there's an ethyl on the left, a second ethyl on the right, you do not say ethyl, ethyl ether, you simply say diethyl ether. Those are whiskers. These are big floppy ears. Who is this now? It's the ether bunny. Yay. You know, when I signed up to be a teacher, there's a little contract you have to sign. You must do that joke when you discuss ethers. <laughs> Somehow it keeps handed down generation to generation. There's a special class of ethers called epoxides. We were introduced to those last semester. Let's scroll over a little bit, give myself a little more room. When we talked about alkenes, let's look at the simplest alkene. Two carbons double bond together. The IUPAC name is ethene, and the common name is ethylene. Okay, that should be review. Last semester, one of the many reactions we saw alkenes do is that you can oxidize them with an oxidizing agent to create the epoxide. Do you guys remember one of those reagents? Five letter acronym MCPBA. Yep. Um, Metachloro. Ooh. If you're remembering how to name benzene um, compounds, there we go. So we get the M meta chloro. Yeah, so the chloro group is meta to some other group I'm putting over here. What group is that? The peroxy benzoic acid. Well, let's see. Benzoic acid is where you have a carboxylic acid directly attached to the ring. And then you put an H here on this oxygen, that's benzoic acid but we got peroxy benzoic acid, and that's where you connect the second oxygen. And that makes that unstable. This bond is not very happy. Both oxygens are electronegative. They're tugging on these electrons, saying, hey, give me those, because I'm electronegative. That makes this bond very weak, labile, reactive. And um, anyways, one of these oxygens, I believe it's this one, gets donated to the alkene, the pi bond, and we create the epoxide. And this is an ether, right? We got single bond to oxygen connected to carbons, but the bond angles are 60 when they should be 109.5, right? Because every atom, including oxygen, is sp3. So there's a significant amount of angle strain in this molecule, which makes the epoxide definitely different from other ethers. Um, in general, most ethers are really very stable. Um, there's only a small subset of reactions, which we'll cover today in this video, um, that you need to know. And for the most part, if you have any other reaction, reagent present, the ether will just survive it. It just is very stable. Except for this one. These epoxides are quite reactive because of the angle strength, the bond angle strength. Um, naming these epoxides are not an exam. The common name is ethylene oxide. Again, that's kind of um, a logical name. The common name for the simplest alkene is ethylene. And then you add oxygen. So you make the oxide out of ethylene. The common name is simply ethylene oxide. Um, the IUPAC name has to be 1,2. Okay, so the parents Carbons are here, carbon one and two, and that's where you link the epoxy functional group onto the parent ethane, one, two epoxy ethane. Again, not on the exam. However, I believe there's a couple of homework problems that are more like word problems that do not show you the chemical structures. And I'll say something like, what happens when, I don't know, some reagent reacts with ethylene oxide? And then for the homework problem, you have to look up ethylene oxide, or remember this little video and say, oh yeah, that's the simplest epoxide, ethylene oxide. And I realized, as I look at the IUPAC name, I skipped that. Let's go back 
today we ethers and talk about how to assign IUPAC names. Okay, so IUPAC names, what's the pattern? Well, go right back to your nomenclature handout. There's six steps, quick review. Step one, find the longest chain or ring with the most important functional group. Step two, name the parent with its suffix. Suffix identifies that most important functional group. Step three is a number the chain or ring, starting closest to the most important functional group. And then steps four and five, that's where you assign numbers and prefixes to all the extra branches and extra functional groups. And then step six, you put all the prefixes in alphabetic order, followed by the parent and the suffix. So when you name an ether by an IUPAC name, we need a prefix for the ether group. Okay, and this is how the game is played in IUPAC land. Um, you're gonna have some parent. Parent, what do I have here? Um, yeah, start with that one. Let's say benzene is gonna be our parent. And then we have an ether over here. Let's put in the isopropyl group. Okay, so here's my ether. And we're just talking about, we're not gonna give the name yet. We're just gonna define how IUPAC decide to name this. So here's the ether functional group. It's got two sets of carbons. It's got isopropyl on the left and it has well, it looks like the phenol group. Let's kind of nickname it that for now. Okay, one of these is going to be the parent. And one of those sets of carbons is not. The side that's not the parent, you want a nickname with alkyl. And up here, what you're going to do is, in the IUPAC name, you grab the nickname of one side of the carbon, of the oxygen, those carbons. You drop the YL, so alkyl just becomes alk. <laughs> and then instead of using the word ether, that's an oxygen atom, so you use oxy, short for oxygen. And that is now your prefix. The, the format of the prefix is gonna be alkoxy, alk oxy, alkoxy. All right, and if that helps, great. If not, let's see an example. This molecule, step one, find the longest chain or ring with the most important functional group. Okay, the functional groups are an ether, an alcohol, and benzene. So who wins? Who's highest ranked according to IUPAC rules? The pattern is more pi bonds, more oxygen, and oxygen kind of wins. So it turns out the, alco uh, the alcohol, I was gonna say oxygen, but there's two. The alcohol function group is most important. That's highest priority. So it must be on the parent. So the alcohol group's connected here to the benzene ring. So that is our parent. So that was step one. Find the longest chain or ring with the most important functional group. And the key is the most important functional group. You have seen examples where sometimes the longest chain or ring doesn't win because the short chain or the short ring has the most important functional group and that declares it to be the parent. All right, this molecule, we found our parent. Let's name it, that's step two. That's phenol, phenol, or phenol. Lots of pronunciations. Phenol is probably the most common one. Step three, number the chain or the parent. Number the parent. Okay, um, when you use the name phenol, with the OL ending, that declares there's an al alcohol on benzene, and we've already identified where carbon one is. It's where the alcohol group connects to the benzene ring. And now count clockwise or count clock clockwise to get to the other group. Uh, you can go <laughs> clockwise or count clockwise. The ether is connected to the carbon four on benzene. Okay, I don't know, I'll go counterclockwise. Um, that was step three, number it. Four, number and identify with a prefix all the extra groups. Well, that's the ether group. Okay, so this is how you construct the prefix for this group. Well, first identify the alkane, which we're gonna nickname alkyl. Well, it's isopropane, the nickname is isopropyl. Yeah, that's an isopropyl group. And then we identify the oxygen using oxy. 
and there's too many Y's, and maybe that's the logic. So drop the YL. And we got isopropoxy. That's showing up on carbon four. So now we have the prefix for isopropoxy, propoxy. And that's it. That's the only extra group on this molecule. So for isopropoxy phenol, phenol is the name. And if you like, you can use pair. That works too. Nice. Let's do a couple more, or at least one more. Got that one. Oh, I need that one. Two more, two more. Take that back. No, we can cover. <laughs> I have two ideas to cover. I got one example that'll take care of both. Okay, so what we got here? One, two, three, four, five, six carbons. I'm going to put a double bond right there. At the right-hand side, I'm going to link an oxygen and stick on a benzene. Let's name this. Okay, step one, find the longest chain of ring with the most important functional group. <sighs> we got an oxygen, we got benzene, and we got an alkene. I told you before the pattern was oxygen kind of beats out the double bond. That's what it did up here. The alcohol group wins. Okay, IUPAC and its great wisdom said that ether is one of the lowest ranked functional groups. I think they did that so they would not have to use a suffix for the ether. There is no suffix for ether in the IUPAC nomenclature rules. So it's always a prefix. If you're using an IUPAC name, the ether is always a prefix. So it's always gonna lose. Sorry, this oxygen's the exception. Usually oxygen in a functional group makes it more important, higher ranked. Ah, uh, here, sorry, Ether, you've been delegated to the bottom of the list. So benzene versus alkene, one of those is gonna win and be the highest ranked functional group. Well, back in a video, we talked about alkyl arenes or alkane substitute arenes. What do you do when there's an alkane attached to benzene because um, especially here the alkene it's kind of tied with benzene you go with the longer chain or IUPAC has a loophole if you can create a simpler name go with that for your parent and that's what we have to evoke here that's what we have to invoke what's the word we have to use we have a, a ring of six versus a chain of six neither one's longer we got an alkene versus benzene. IUPAC says, yeah, they're both carbon carbon double bonds. They're kind of evenly matched. One's going to be the parent, one's not. The parent is going to get numbers. The other group will not. So which of these two do we like to have numbers for? What will make an easier name? The alkene, that triple, sorry, that double bond is in the middle. I need numbers to identify where that double bond shows up. So using the IAPAC loophole, choose a chain or ring with the that'll create the simpler um, IAPAC name. Here's my parent. Capture all the carbons. There you go. There's the parent. That was step one. Step two, name it. Oh, that's a chain of six. That's hexane. Oh, with the right suffix. Well, on this chain, there's an ene group. So now I got the parent name to be hexene. Nice. Step three, number it so that you get to the functional group as fast as you can. Well, if I number from the right, one, two, I get to the alkene on carbon two. From the left side, it takes longer. That's not the right way to number the chain. Okay, um, we numbered it. Step four, add the extra groups with their numbers and prefixes. Well, we got an ether, and this is IUPAC, so we're gonna name the ether group as in some alkoxy group. What's the name of our alkyl group? Um, it's benzene. Ooh, wait, benzene is a parent name. What are the nicknames or prefixes for benzene? 
Well, they're at the top of the screen. There are two. We can either use phenyl or benzyl. We'll have to remember the difference, right? Benzyl is the one with seven carbons. Phenyl is just a clean benzene ring of six. So what do we have down here? A clean ring of six. This is the phenyl group. So that's, oh wait, it's not alkyl, it's not alkyl, it's alk. So drop the YL and add oxy and you get phenoxy. Phenyl, what's the prefix name? Drop the YL, add oxy, phenoxy. And they show up on carbon one. So, ooh, I don't know from there. One phenoxy hexene is almost the parent name. Gay brain, a little red flag blur to me. Wait, alkenes. Something special about alkenes you have to watch out for. Cis and trans or E and Z. It's always safe to use E and Z if it applies. Um, you know, right? Some alkenes are not E nor Z. Cis and trans is easier sometimes. So what do we got over here? Well, the identical groups are on opposite sides of the alkene. You have to go across the Atlantic, transatlantic voyage. Yeah, this is the trans isomer. So there we go. Now we have the name trans one phenoxy hexy. Ooh, where's that double bond? That's something I missed. The double bond starts on two. So eh. let's try again, Des. Trans one phenoxy. And now we have choices. We can stick the two in front of the parent. Or we can place the, uh, I, no, the number right in front of the prefix. That's IUPAC's latest recommendation. You could also not use trans and use E. Yeah. Quick review on how to assign this E and Z. Find one alkene carbon. Look at its two groups. Well, maybe I'll circle it. Um, circle the alkene carbon. To this alkene carbon, there's a carbon and a hydrogen. Who has a higher atomic number? Carbon does. Now I'll go to the other alkene carbon. I'll put a square around that one. Okay, attached to this alkene carbon, there's a carbon and a hydrogen. Carbon wins. And then lastly, where are the two winning groups? Well, the square is on one side, double bond, the circle's on the other side. Here's my double bond. That's not on the same side. The Z is the same side, Z. No, it's the other one, the Entgegen, which means opposite. So that's the E isomer. There you go. Let's see. Covered a lot of nomenclature rules in that. We are done with ethers. Sweet. Okay, most organic textbooks then say, you know, after you mentioned the epoxides, then they say, you know what? We really don't have a home, a special chapter for sulfur functional groups. And if you go to the periodic table, which I should have loaded up before starting this Zoom session, Zoom recording. So let me just make a part of the periodic table from memory. If you look at it enough times, you start to memorize stuff. Argon, I think. Anyways, main point. And the same family as oxygen is sulfur. So when we start talking about ethers and alcohols, well, alcohols was the last, last unit. Um, most organic chemists say, hey, let's quickly discuss sulfur containing functional groups. And we have two. Um, we have the alcohol group, sorry, chain <laughs> transition back to oxygen. If you think about oxygen, with only single bonds, there are two. Um, you can connect two carbons to the oxygen or one carbon oxygen with a hydrogen. You get your alcohol and you get your ether. Okay, go down the periodic table one row, make the swap oxygen. You come out for sulfur. That ah. so oxygen. Try to get back in there. There we go. Uh, the names of these groups are thiol. Isn't that interesting? There's an OL ending here, kind of reminding us of the alcohol group. And then this one, 
Well, we don't have another name for ether. They have sulfide. Yeah. Okay. So we have the thiols and the sulfides. So quickly, we'll learn how to name those here. Hmm. One more thing about sulfur, though. Sulfur has a strong affinity or makes a strong bond to mercury. So when scientists started looking at compounds containing sulfur, they found that a lot of these compounds, sulfur, like to attach to mercury. In fact, you can purify mercury using sulfur compounds. So you precipitate it out, take it out, take the sulfur and mercury out, and you can purify it and get pure mercury that way. So knowing that sulfur likes to attach to mercury, one of the nicknames for sulfur is mercaptan, meaning capturing mercury. I know, it's confusing, because when I look at the name that we're going to see for common names, the format is alkyl mercaptan. I think of mercury. And then you have to go, wait, wait, it's not mercury, it's sulfur. So we've got a couple examples from um, the ether functional group. We had, um, I shouldn't do ether, sorry. Let's just start over. Where's my rewind button? Let's put a, a methyl group onto a thiol. And so this is simply, the common name is simply methylmercaptan. Anyone planning to be a nurse or a doctor? Um, thiols are really stinky. A lot of the compounds that come out of the back end of a skunk contain thiols, also amines, I believe. Um, the stink they put in natural gas is a thiol. So if you smell natural gas, pure natural gas has no odor. They actually put a mercaptan, I think it's ethyl mercaptan, into natural gas. So you can detect, hey, someone left the burner on, no flame. Let's air off the place before it blows up. Um, but nurses and doctors, if you smell the breath of a patient, patient that has really stinky, skunky breath, you're smelling thiols, well, check their dental hygiene first. On the other hand, they might be suffering from a, acute liver disease. Um, decomposition of the liver releases thiols that get into the bloodstream, they actually get in the lung and exhale. You can detect a strong stinky skunk-like odor on their breath, sign of advanced liver disease. Methylmercaptan is a compound that's probably being smelled or released by the, the patient. Um, right here in key concepts, put an isopropyl group on an SH group, you got isopropyl mercaptan. Nice. Okay, if the extra group is too complicated to name as just an alkyl group, methyl, isopropyl, tech, not tech, tert butyl, something like that, um, phenyl, benzyl. If we don't have a nice nickname, alkyl name, then you have to switch and use an IUPAC name. Thankfully, IUPAC decided to use the thiol as the suffix. So knowing that SH is the thiol group, you got the suffix in IUPAC names. Cool. If the thiol group's being outranked by a compound containing oxygen, not ether, ether still is demoted to the bottom, but if you have an oxygen, like an alcohol, aldehyde, carboxylic acid, some other functional group with oxygen, or some other functional group beside the alkene that has a pi bond and the alkyne. If you have someone else that outranks it, again, al aldehydes, ketones, amides, things with pi bonds, okay, then you can't use thiol as a suffix, you need a prefix. And we're gonna use mercapto, mercapto. So yeah, mercaptan, is the common name for a thiol group. Mercapto is the prefix name when you're assigning IUPAC names. Okay, so we had isopropyl mercaptan. It's drawn again here. Well, let's draw that out. If you decide not to use isopropyl mercaptan and you want to name it by IUPAC name, then let's draw out the isopropyl group. There it is. Give the carbon a hydrogen, attach it to the thiol group. Okay, the IUPAC name would be, well, here's the most important group. That's thiol. 
as a suffix. The parent chain is three long, that's propane. Where's the thiol attached? One, two, it's attached to carbon two of propane. Or you can put the number right next to the suffix. Some of you might be saying, hey, wait, when if that was an alcohol, instead of the thiol, the IUPAC name would have been 2-isopropanol, right? Use the old suffix instead of the thiol suffix. Where's the E? <laughs> well, if you had the E here, you have two vowels together. IUPAC says, nah, I don't like that. Drop the E. Um, here you keep the E because it's right next to a consonant. Again, if you drop the E over here, I will give you full credit. If you put the E in over here, I will still give you full credit. You got the main idea. Okay, um, that's the IUPAC name when thiol wins. We got another molecule here. Two carbons, and on one side's a thiol, the other side is a, an alcohol. Let's assign the IUPAC name, right? Step one, find the longest chain with the most important functional group. Well, it's a chain of two. Found it, name it is step two. So that's ethane. I'm gonna think about dropping that E. Um, and you have to add the suffix for the most important functional group. Oxygen outranks sulfur. Oxygen, pi bonds, higher ranking. So the parent name is ethanol, recognizing the OL alcohol group as the most important group. Step three, number the chain, starting closest to the most important functional group. So carbon one is here next to the alcohol. The thiol, thiol group is on carbon two. Step four and five, number and assign a number. Did I say that right? Number and name <laughs> the extra groups. While well, it's a thiol group, but thiol is a suffix. I need the prefix name, which is the one that sticks to mercury, mercapto. So on carbon two is the mercapto group. This is two mercapto ethanol. If you want to put a one in there to identify where the alcohol group is, you may. But I think it's redundant, right? The only way. Yeah, the alcohol group has to be on carbon one. Otherwise, why did you use a two for the thiol? Okay, when in doubt, add your numbers. Sounds like I'm expressing a little doubt. Yeah. Okay, no, it turns out no. This is a perfectly acceptable IUPAC name, but you remember from naming compounds last semester, sometimes you can drop a number and sometimes you can't. It all depends on whether there are any options. So there's no other option for the alcohol group other than carbon one, if you've already said the thiol group is on carbon two of a two carbon chain. All right, what else? We should do a couple more. Play around with the thiol, IUPAC naming of thiols. Yeah, more room down here, sweet. I got two compounds to name. Let me double check, yep. Let's draw benzene with the thiol group twice. Oh, and let's put an ethyl group here. Oh, and then let's make them different. How about we put a double bonded oxygen on the bottom column, on the bottom molecule? Let's assign IUPAC names. Or you know what? You if I ask you to name an organic molecule on a test, you pick. You want to use a common name or an IUPAC name, you decide. So you might be saying, ooh, common names of thiols are simply alkyl or captain. <laughs> Took me a bit, right? <laughs> What's the common name for a thiol? We're captain. Weird. Captain, oh captain, my captain. Um, so you might say, okay, is this benzene ring with an ethyl branch can I name that in a simple alkyl nickname? No, I can't. Same is true down here. There's not a single 
word phrase like isopropyl or terp-butyl that can identify all the carbons. So dang it, don't use a common name here. Gotta use IEPAC. Okay, IEPAC name. Step one, find the longest chain of ring with the most important functional group. Benzene, thiol, ethyl. Thiol group wins. That's the most important functional group. Okay, um, it must be on the parent. Well, that's cool. It's a ring of six versus a chain of two. I like that. And now we have to name it. That's step two is name the parent ring. Well, that's benzene. Oh, wait, any special names? Right, so if this ethyl group was methyl, a methyl group on benzene is toluene, right? If there's a double bond to this two carbon branch, that would be styrene. No, actually, there's no other special names for this benzene ring given this structure. So yeah, the parent name is benzene. And then add the suffix, thiol. Benzene thiol is the parent name. Where is the suffix? We want to be as close, when we number the parent, benzene, get to that most important functional group, the thiol group in this case, as fast as you can. So that's carbon one. Then go to your next branch as fast as you can. So this is simply 3-ethyl benzene thiol. Or if you want to use meta, you can. Oops, a little dash there. Meta-ethyl benzene thiol. I only have two groups on benzene, so the ortho meta para can be used. That looks like methyl though. Make sure that dash is in there. <laughs> <laughs> Ew, may I stick with the three, make sure it's clear. All right, redo it down here. Simple oxygen, what change did that make? Well, what's the parent name when you have a two carbon ketone on benzene? Oh yeah, you have a ketone. So this funky parent name ends in own. Um, the bens, it's sort of like phenyl. Nickname's phenyl, so we're gonna add phen. So those are our clues. And then you have a two carbon group with a double bond O. Do you remember that molecule from general chemistry? You probably drew it this way. Yeah, that was acetic acid. Oh, so there's another clue. There we go. So this is actually, the parent name is acetophenone. Funky name, but there's some logic behind how it's constructed by IUPAC. Or actually, it's probably a common name first and IUPAC said, we love it. All right, so that's the parent. Oh, the most important functional group, I skipped that, was oxygen. So this two carbon group, it's supposed to be the parent, but we actually have a pretty cool name that takes care of eight carbons. So use that instead, that'll simplify the name. Okay, what else we got? Um, everything's been circled as the parent, we identified that, got the parent name. Step two is number to ring, well, what makes this acetophenone is a ketone attached to the benzene ring. So there's carbon one. And now the thiol group is on a three. So that's step three, number the ring or num number the parent. Now step four and five is identify the extra group, the thiol group with a prefix. So not thiol, but the nickname, Mercapto. There you go. And it's on carbon three. And isn't that a weird thing? We got two valves crashing into each other. IPAC wants us to leave it. It rolls off the tongue more easily if you leave in the oh, mercapto acetophenone rather than mercaptoacetophenone. I don't know if I'm even saying that right. If you drop the O, I'll give you full credit. Don't drop the A though, that'd be too weird. <laughs> leave the O in there. This is also the meta isomer too. Let's see, do I need anything else? Nope, thiol's done. Last functional group for naming in this video are the sulfides. They're fairly uncommon. If you take more biochemistry, you'll see more of them. Um, but in this level of organic chemistry, we're not even gonna cover the IUPAC naming just because you're not really gonna use it. A common name is simple enough. Okay, so 
Um, what is a sulfide? It's a sulfur single bonded to two carbons. Well, wait, that looks like the ether group. So yay, the common name is following the same format as the common name of ethers, which was alkyl, alkyl, ether. But all we're gonna do is change ether to sulfide. Because all we're gonna do is change the O to a sulfur atom. It's cool. So this is a methyl group. That's an isopropyl group. Alpha back over again. You got isopropyl methyl sulfide. And this one is the diethyl sulfide molecule. So same pattern as naming ethers with a common name. Just change ether to sulfide. Sweet. Done with naming, time for a little intermission. Next thing we normally do when we discuss a new functional group is talk about any special properties. So this is not on the exam. However, if you work with ethers in the lab, you should know that ethers react slowly with air. So if you leave the top of the bottle open of ether, oxygen from the air can get in there. And even if you're really quick, open and close. So open the bottle, pour out some, snap the lid on quick. There's still exposure to the air. So once you open a fresh bottle of ether, you need to label it. And oftentimes when, just so we don't forget, when the bottle is delivered to the stock room, we put a date on it. So we know how old the bottle is. And then uh, over time, you open and close it, open and close it, getting ether out of there. There's an exposure to air which has oxygen and the ether functional group. Again, did I say that before? This is not on exam. Just interesting, but helpful safety advice. The ether functional group, if you take the ether bunny, diethyl ether, he'll slowly react with oxygen. And whoops. And what it does is it inserts itself in between a carbon hydrogen bond. And you form the unstable peroxide bond. Remember MCPBA had this oxygen oxygen single bond? Good oxidizing agent. Okay, and it can continue to do that. Um, this oxygen can then add to another ether. You can make these big molecules. Again, this is not an exam, so let me don't let me get too far into the details. The most important things to remember is one, oxygen reacts with ethers. So label your cans of ethers. These peroxides, as they accumulate with time, if there's too many, if the concentration is too high, you need to call the bomb squad because they are shock sensitive, which means if you drop the can, it can detonate. If you tap the can hard enough, give it a shock, it'll detonate. Okay, <laughs> so who wants to work with ether in the lab? Make sure it's proper label and make sure it's dilute so that you don't concentrate the ether peroxides that might be forming in there. Also, good advice, use ether that contains inhibitors of peroxide formation, BHT or ethanol. Hey, BHT, next time you're eating some Fruit Loops or Lucky Charms, your favorite breakfast cereal, see if the package has been lined with BHT. It's a preservative that keeps the food fresh because it reacts with oxygen from the air to keep it from going stale. Same thing here in ethers. Add BHT and it reacts with the oxygen that might be entering the bottle from using the lid. If you really want to know what this stands for, you can look it up on the internet, but it means butylated. It sounds like mutilated, but no, it's butylated hydroxytoluene. Hydroxy. Toluene. And it has this structure. So you know what toluene looks like. Just put the methyl group down here. And then we'll hydroxy it, alcohol group. Okay, that, that looks like phenol. That should be the IUPAC name. Yeah, this is a common name. And then butylate it with tert butyl groups. Anyways, that's the preservative. What else do we need to know? Oh, if you're working with ethers in a lab, it's probably going to be the solvent. And then at the end of your experiment that you're doing a reaction in this ether solvent, you want to get your product out of the ether solution. Well, if your product is solid, excellent. Just filter it, dispose of ether safely, you're good. 
But if your product is a liquid, it's probably dissolved in the ether. So if you have two liquids dissolved together, how do you separate one from the other? Probably by distillation. How does that work? Well, you got a heating mantle here and you heat up your mixture of solvent and product and impurities and the lowest boiling compound will evaporate first, hit the cold condenser with the water lines running through it, right? So heat it up, sorry, back up, back to the heating mantle. You're gonna boil this. What gas is coming off? The compound with the lowest boiling point, the one that's easiest to boil. So vapors or fumes of that compound are gonna come up in here, hit the cold condenser, which means the gas will condense. Good name for that device. And the liquid will start dripping in over into the receiving flask. That's simple distillation. Okay, well, we talked about using diethyl ether. You got some compound, I don't know, but make it a big compound. Maybe you have some groups on here. I don't know, let's just make it an alkane. Long chain alkane, I don't know what type that is. And then maybe you're starting to make some peroxides. Maybe you're using some old ether. Shame on you, should have looked at the label on the can, dispose of it. Who would have the lowest boiling point? Well, first you look at intermolecular forces, right? Can someone hydrogen bond? That's gonna be the stickiest, most tightly held together molecules. That's gonna elevate the boiling point, make it harder to boil. Then you look at dipole-dipole. Okay, so these two can do dipole-dipole. Hey, there's a hydrogen bond in the peroxide. Ooh, so I would predict this has the highest boiling point, which means as you heat this, it's gonna stay behind. This alkane, um, does London dispersion, but it's pretty big. So I know the order is hydrogen bonding, dipole dipole, London dispersion, Van der Waals forces, induced dipole dipole, whatever you want to call it, usually has the lowest intermolecular force, um, but it's pretty big. And the intermolecular forces increase with boiling point, with um, molar mass, with size. So this one probably has the second highest. And this has the lowest. So here's our reaction mix mixture with some product. You start boiling it, the ether is going to come off first. Good, you want to get rid of the solvent. Next, your product's going to start dissolve, um, evaporating. So it comes out. Good, switch the flask so you can have the ether in one flask and your product in another one. And now you want as much product as you can, right? So you let this go. Keep distilling, keep distilling. What's left behind? The shock sensitive peroxide. Ooh, and you're heating it. So at some point it's gonna detonate. So never distill to dryness. So even if you're using fresh ether, you're 100% sure you tested it for peroxide, no peroxides. Well, during your course of reaction, you're exposing it to oxygen. It's a chance that some might peroxides might start to build up. It's a slow reaction, so I'm exaggerating. I just want to instill in you a sense of, hey, never, ever, ever let your distillation flask go dry, even if you're not using ether. It's just bad practice. Um, whatever remains is going to burn. It's going to be hard to clean. And if it had some peroxides, it might detonate. You don't want that. So safety tip for today. Should have had this bottom part <laughs> on the screen the whole time. This is a visual reminder, never distill the evaporation flask to dryness, as there is a risk of explosion and fire, or at the very least, charred glassware from stuff burning after everything's evaporated. Okay, something on the fun side. Um, there's a special type of ether called a crown ether. Why do they call it crown ether? Because it looks like a crown. If you, um, I should have found a, a picture of this from the edge view, right? These carbons are kind of zigzagging with the oxygens forming this ring. And so it kind of looks like a crown from the edge. It's kind of cool. Crown ethers are really interesting because the gap in the middle can be tuned to the precise size of some of these alkaline metals. So potassium, 
sticks tightly, very nicely, right in the center of what's called 18 crown six, the common name for this ether. Um, you have six oxygens and 18 atoms in the ring. Oh, I forgot to mention, not on exam. Just interesting stuff. 18 atoms in a ring, and the gap in here is perfectly suited for potassium, but not so much for sodium. It's too light, too small. It's a, not held tightly. Lithium is much smaller. Um, it doesn't fit. So you actually can purify mixtures of these salts, lithium, potassium, sodium, um, by using 18 crown six. It'll selectively bind the potassium, and then there's ways of trying to get the potassium back out, or at least you can get it away from the other ones. If you want the sodium, use a smaller ring because sodium is smaller, 15 crown five. And if you want lithium, well, 12 crown four. But what's really cool about this is that if you think about the crown ether and ask about its polarity, well, the outside of it is mainly carbon. And you might remember, or you actually just discussed intermolecular forces, um, that carbon-carbon bonds Two atoms, two identical elements, the same element attach to each other, forms a nonpolar covalent bond. And carbon with hydrogen is also a nonpolar covalent bond. So these parts of the crown ether are actually nonpolar. But if you bind an ion in the middle, the interior is ionic and very polar. So it's kind of cool is that you can take a crown ether, bind some salt, and the ionic character gets hidden from the solvent inside the crown ether. The exterior of the molecule, the exterior part of the, of the crown, the ring, is touching the solvent, and that's going to be nonpolar interactions. So what you can do is you can get polar compounds to dissolve in nonpolar solvents. Very cool. So there's a video. Here's the, the link to it. Um, short little video just showing how someone said, hey, let's take some potassium permanganate. It's not all fitting on the screen. Here we go. Some potassium permanganate. Here's the solid form of KMNO4. Um, it's an ionic compound. You take some benzene, which is completely nonpolar. They won't dissolve each other. But yeah, a little crown ether. That's what's in this little bottle here. Just a little bit. And then um, the potassium will bind to the crown ether, and then the crown ether with the potassium will drag the permanganate into benzene. And you can see the purplish color of permanganate showing up in the benzene solution. It is dissolving. And then you can do oxidation chemistry in a nonpolar solvent. Very cool. Not on the exam, though, just cool chemistry. All right, let's get on to some reactions of ethers, and it's a short list. Oh, wait, I think we first talk about how to make them. Let's do that first. And it's review. OK. That's cool. If you want to play the mind game, it's not new material. Just refresh your memory. You already know this. Beautiful. OK, the, maybe the best way, the classic way of making an ether is through an SN2 reaction. In fact, it's so popular, it has its own name the way is some ether synthesis. It's just an SN2 reaction. What's SN2? Well, take an alkyl halide. Does tertiary work on an SN2 reaction? No, 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 too crowded. Right, so you have to take a primary or a methyl alkyl halide, some secondary work, but, right? Do you remember what happens if it's too crowded and you're using a oxygen with a negative charge? with no resonance. It's a strong base. So you can get E2 reactions. I say compete. If it's tertiary, the E2 totally wins. You're not going to get any SN2 product winning or making product. If it's secondary, you're going to get some SN2. You're going to get some E2 byproduct. Use a aprotic solvent, polar aprotic solvent to kind of help the SN2 go a little faster, maybe a little DMSO or DMF, acetone, acetonitrile. Again, 
You guys know this stuff. Just review your notes on SN2 and you know how to make ethers as long as you start with the negatively charged oxygen attached to some carbons. The R group, I don't use that very often. Um, R group just means some alkyl group. So if we take CH3O minus, add your favorite alkyl halide. I don't know what mine is. I like bromine. I put it on the end of a chain of four. Then wherever the bromine's attached, that's your polar covalent bond, creating a slight positive charge. Strong base, good nucleophile. Oxygen is going to attack that and kick out the halide. Ooh, nice two-step mechanism. And uh, you do need to remember the mechanism. And you get your product. So attached to the oxygen is four carbons. So I got one, two, three, four. And if you want to take care of the byproduct, it's Br minus. Cool. Anything else about the ethers? Oh, we have to make the, the nucleophile, right? So um, back in second semester, when we talked about SN2 reactions, we, especially for synthesis questions on the exam, you said you had to make this compound. And what you need is a strong base. So typically we use sodium amide, NaNH2, and an alcohol, right? So this is review two, yay. Um, we took a very strong base, sodium amide. We were first introduced to that, I believe, when we we're doing um, triple bond chemistry, right? If you take an alkyne, there's a hydrogen there. And we need this very powerful base to remove the hydrogen from a carbon atom. But this base is strong enough to do it. You make the anion of a triple bond, and then NH2 is going to become ammonia. And then you can do some chemistry. Probably an SN2 reaction, right? Take the lone pair at the end of the triple bond, kick out the halide, and you add the methyl group to the end of the triple bond. Awesome. OK. Turns out this semester, you can also use sodium hydride. Um, I have to look it up, see if it works on triple bonds. Scientists typically don't. I think it's because this is more ionic and that's nonpolar, so you have some solubility problems. Um, sodium is a cation, hydrogen is an anion. It's actually the hydride ion. Anyways, this is mainly just for alcohols. You can use sodium hydride or sodium amide to do the same chemistry, right? So the hydride ion or grab an H plus from the alcohol, make the anion of an alcohol, alkoxide. Sounds like alkox alkoxy from the ether name, alkoxide. We want a common name for this anion. Okay, and then now you can, you got this negative oxygen set up. Here's a primary halide and you make an ether. Just remember, you cannot use sodium hydroxide. You get no reaction. Well, that's not entirely true. You actually get an equilibrium. So sure, hydroxide ion, back in general chemistry was a strong base. And so sometimes it pulls off the hydrogen from this oxygen. Um, the hydrogen goes on to the hydroxy group to make water. And where's the sodium? Is it still stuck to the same oxygen here? No, no, no. Water's neutral. The product, this negatively charged oxygen, is where the sodium hangs out, right? It's just a spectator ion sodium. And now ask yourself, who's a stronger base? This alkoxy group, oxygen with an ethyl? or hydroxide ion. Well, it's a good time to go and review. Oh, where is it? <laughs> Should have put it in here. Go back and review the order of basicity video. That's a really useful video. We're gonna keep referring to throughout this semester. It's a way of, prior, of ranking um, acids and bases. It's, it'll help you identify the strongest base. And then you can use that information, in this case, to rule out sodium hydroxide 
it's not going to work on an alcohol. Okay, so what's the, the plan? Um, the difference between NaO with an ethyl and NaO with a hydrogen is that ethyl is a weak activator in benzene chemistry. And actually, it's also activating the oxygen. Ethyls, alkyl groups, a benzene ring is a weak activating group, orthopara activating group. It's supplying electrons and helping the reaction go better in aromatic reactions, electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. But the same electron donating properties happen here. The ethyl group is, is going to supply more electrons to this negative oxygen. So in, instead of a negative 1.00 charge, maybe it's a negative 1.1 charge, a negative 1.2 charge. It's going to be more negative and it's going to be more basic than NaOH minus. So nature favors the more stable product. The equilibrium is going to lie over here, which means this is going to be your predominant species and hydroxide ion. These two are going to be in the mixture, and you're not going to have much of these two. In other words, finally, sodium hydroxide is not strong enough that make the anion of an alcohol. So avoid it. Second way to make ethers, really good way. We also saw this. I think it was in a homework question. Okay, so that technically doesn't count. So maybe this is a new one. But the first part is not. So, whoops. Going back to our alkene chemistry, one of the reactions we saw was oxymercuration, demercuration, right? So quickly I'll review of the mechanism because we need it for the reaction to form ethers. Okay, mercury acetate, HG, parentheses OAC2, not the best acronym for mercury acetate. AC is actually on the periodic table as actinium. Organic okay, chemists, what are you doing? Um, we just have to remember AC in organic chemistry does not refer to actinium for the periodic table. It refers to acetate. And from general chemistry, you can draw the, um, the formulas, chem, uh, chemical formulas for acetate, C, C2H3O2 or CH3OOH. No H at the end of acetate. Um, I had a student come back and tell me years later, um, after he took my class, he took the MCAT. He said, hey, Dennis, you gotta tell your students that on the MCAT, I saw them use mercury with trifluoroacetate. And it was the same reaction. So just watch out for that. That is a modern um, improvement to the oxymercuration, demercuration reaction. The trifluoroacetate salt of mercury works better. Anywho, what we said is HOAC, could be drawn like this. That's the Lewis dot structure of, a, of an acetate ion connected to mercury. And we said the mechanism is that the pi bond jumps out and grabs the mercury to form a three-membered ring, a triangle. And one of these acetates, I'll pick this one, leaves. Okay, and the pi bond left. Oh, the methyl group's still there. Oh, and this sits on the ring. I don't think we worried about cis and trans. This is the one. Yeah, this one's not always consistent. You don't always get anti-addition or syn addition. Um, no, so let's ignore that. I know it's on a ring. Maybe the mercury is on the same side. I probably should use, be using wedges, but in lab, that's not, cons not so consistent. OK, so for the mercury reaction, you don't have to use dash or wedge bonds. Um, what comes next? Um, we got water. THF, that's an ether. Tetrahydrofuran. Why is it here? It's a co-solvent. Why do you need a co-solvent? The mix of very polar water with the very nonpolar alkene. Because this part of the molecule is nonpolar, top part is polar, 
brings them together. Kind of analogous to those crown ethers. Okay, um, no THF in the mechanism, it's just a solvent. Um, it said bring in the water. That is a reagent. Water, oxygen is slightly negative. Where's the positive charge? Well, there's a plus charge on the mercury, but it doesn't attack there. Um, mercury is actually, I believe, more electronegative than the carbon. You don't need to know that, just a, a fact that can help you understand the mechanism. You still don't need to know it. Just know that mercury has a plus charge. <laughs> so what do you think these bonding electrons are doing? They're attracted to that positive charge. So as the electrons in the bond flow towards the mercury, that creates slight positive charges on these carbons. Another idea, tying back to what we said earlier about order of basicity, carbon is electron um, donating group, a weak activating orthopara group. So the carbons in the ring right here, these carbons are supplying electrons to the mercury to help stabilize that positive charge. And as they lose electrons that they donate, the carbons themselves require a slight positive charge. Probably over analyzing this, sorry. Main idea is slight positive charges on the carbon. And now look at the degree of each carbon. Okay, carbon on top, what degree are you? And the carbon says, um, how many carbons am I linked to? I got a mercury atom, but don't count that. I got this carbon up here, one over here, third one there, I'm tertiary. Hey, carbon on the bottom, what degree are you? Uh, I got one carbon up here, one on the bottom left, I'm secondary. How do you feel about that positive charge? Not good, but tertiary is not complaining as much as secondary because tertiary carbocations, I know that's not a carbocation, but starting to act like one, slight, slight positive charge. Tertiary is more stable than secondary. So this carbon is going to donate more because it can stabilize a positive charge better than secondary. And the water is tuned into that positive charge. It attacks the more substituted carbon. And that breaks open the ring, right? There's angle strain here. The bond angle is 60 degrees. And it opens up the ring. OK, so the mercury is, this bond on the bottom stayed intact. The mercury is still there with its acetate, the water molecule attaches to the other carbon. Oxygen now has a positive charge because it makes three bonds. And that's our next step. Scroll to the right for more room. And now um, we're trying to make this product down here. So we got the alcohol group attached to that tertiary carbon. Ooh, on our tertiary carbon, we have water. There's an extra H. And a plus. I gotta get rid of H plus. Ooh, that's an acid H plus. I need a base. Well, there's two in the solution. There's water and there's acetate. So you can use either one. Acetate is slightly more basic than water, so that's probably the one that's gonna react. But there's more water, the concentration of water is higher, so you can use either one. You can use the water molecule or the acetate molecule to remove that hydrogen. And end the mechanism of oxymercuration. You might remember from last semester, we did not review the second step, the demercuration, where you add sodium hydride. We didn't do that. It's a redox reaction. Hydrogen ions being supplied and kicks out the mercury. And you get this alcohol. If you want to write the hydrogen in there from so you more hydrate, you can, but there's a product. That's what we saw last semester. Yay, we reviewed it. Hopefully that was a nice refresher because here's the tweak to make ethers. Don't use water, stop it. Sorry, I'm having some problems here with, with Zoom. Um, switch the water molecule with your favorite alcohol. Let's back up here. Back in the mechanism, we said we took the water molecule. What if I rewrite the water molecule this way? So instead of H2O, I just put an OH group with an H on it. And that's what's right here. Oh wait, I wanna leave that. Yeah. 
Well, if we leave the H here and we write the water molecule like this. So all we have to do to make our product, the alcohol, is remove one of these H's from the oxygen. And then we see the group we want. We want the alcohol group. Okay, someone very clever said, hmm, what if I don't use water and I use an alcohol? Well then, whoops, not that way. Then instead of the OH group, we got this group with attached hydrogen. That's the alcohol group. And then you follow the exact same mechanism, but here, um, instead of an H being on there and getting alcohol as a product, you have some alkyl group and you're gonna get an ether. Cool. So let's put it all together. If you wanna fast forward this part, you can, cause you already saw the mechanism, but let's just do it one more time. Still use mercury acetate. Pi bond jumps out, grabs the mercury, kicks out. I'll use this one, same one I did before. Kicks out one of the acetates. Acetate. And now we don't have any water in our reaction. We have an alcohol. It behaves just like the oxygen from water, goes after that tertiary carbon up here, kicks out the mercury atom, breaks open that triangle. The oxygen stays attached, it keeps all its carbons. We'll put it on the side. So there's my alcohol group attached to where the mercury used to be. Mercury's down here now. And then bring in the acetate or bring in an alcohol. They both have lone pairs on those oxygens that could serve as a base to remove that H. It's probably the acetate though, it's a stronger base. The lone pair on the acetate, grab that hydrogen. And then we make an ether. And that's what we're trying to do in this unit. In this video, we're showing how to make ethers. And will you allow me to abbreviate the acetate group as OAC? And then you add, after this reaction is all done, start the second reaction by adding in some sodium borohydride and you make your ether. Whoops, not benzene. There you go. Nice. I think that's it. Yep. So really, how to make ethers, two ways, oxymercuration, demercuration, where you substitute an alcohol or an SN2 reaction. I won't do it to you, but there's another variation that might show up on the MCAT. They may choose to leave out the THF. Why? Don't you need a co-solvent? Well, we need the co-solvent to mix water with the alkene. Water is extremely polar and the alkene nonpolar. Well, the alcohol is going to have some carbons, so it's going to be less polar. So it might be possible, and I think it is, I think isopropanol and this cyclohexene molecule can mix in each other. So you don't need the THF. So if on exam, not my exams, on the MCAT rather, or in the homework maybe, or on the internet, if you're researching this, if you see them omit THF, that's because the alcohol is serving as a solvent and still gonna work. All righty, let's end this video by talking about all the reactions that ethers can do. There are three. Yeah, that's not too bad. Um, ethers are very much like alkanes. What do you know about alkanes? Basically, you can burn them and you can do free radical halogenation reactions on them. Two reactions of alkanes because alkane, carbon carbon single bonds are incredibly stable. Ethers are also very unstable. Not as unstable, sorry, stable, 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 stable. They're very, very stable. <laughs> Ethers are also very stable, just like alkanes, very stable. Throw oxidizers, throw acids, throw bases at alkanes and ethers, 
generally no reaction takes place. The one exception is with extremely, extremely strong acids like HBr or HI. HCl, not strong enough. Okay, that's pretty bizarre. So you know HCl to be a strong acid and ethers don't react with HCl. Okay, so that gives you a sense of how stable the ether functional group is. So most of the time, if an ether is showing up in your molecule, like later in the semester, if you see a molecule, hey, there's an ether, is it gonna react too? No, it won't, unless you're using HBr, HI, or a third acid that I'll show you in a minute. Okay, what happens? Well, sadly, one of two mechanism happens. So you need to pick the right one. It's either going to be an SN1 mechanism or an SN2. And I recommend think about whether the SN1 will work. That's what nature's thinking. So what do you know about SN1? In the mechanism, what's the unstable intermediate? The one we always had to worry about. Carbocations. Why do we have to worry about them? Carbocation rearrangements. Ew. Creating lots of products, lowering our yield, more things to draw. We don't like them. <laughs> okay. Um, on the other hand, that's nature's favorite route about cutting or reacting ethers with an, a strong acid. She'll try and make a carbocation first. At least that's my rationalization. So you see, look at, you need to check to see if the ether can actually make a stable carbocation. So let's review our carbocation stability, right? Tertiary is more stable than secondary, more stable than primary, much more stable than methyl. And oh my gosh, don't even think about putting a carbocation on benzene or on a double bond. SP2, no, that is way too unstable. On the other hand, you can't put that double bond, right? Sorry, you can't put that carbocation right next to a double bond. This is a benzylic carbocation. This one is allylic and they're resonance stabilized. Wait, resonance what? Stabilize, which makes them stable. Uh, stabilized. So the most stable carbocations are going to be benzylic and tertiary and allylic. So nature is going to try and go the SN1 route if you use HBr or HI on an ether. If, it's, if the ether, right, what's an ether? Oxygen with carbons on either side. If you check the, each of those carbons attached to the oxygen, and it's not tertiary, it's not benzylic, it's not allylic, then the default mechanism is SN2. Okay. And then that's how you're going to predict products. So let's try it out. Let's start with this one. Let's put another group there. And let's use HBr or HI. Those are the only two strong acids for, you have to worry about SN1, SN2 mechanism. There's a third acid coming, different mechanism. Okay, how does it work? Um, well, when remembering this mechanism, a good, good bit of advice, a good tip is let the most reactive reagent go first. So ethers, benzene, incredibly stable, alkanes, incredibly stable, HBr, ooh, powerful acid. Okay, acid, do your thing. What's your thing? Donate H plus. Okay, so H plus, where do you wanna go? Um, onto a lone pair. So the ether is actually a Lewis base, electron pair donor. Um, hydroxide ion is also Lewis base, right? So if you grab H plus, you can grab one of these lone pairs and attach H plus to it. So do that here with the ether. You protonate the ether, a proton transfers, H plus is simply just a proton. 
Um, so the protonated ether over here, that's the first um, intermediate in your mechanism. Then what's next? Well, now you have to decide if the rest of the mechanism goes SN1 or SN2. Oh, HBr released the hydrogen bromide is still there. Okay, so is this reaction going to go by SN2 or SN1? Check SN1 first. So here's my ether. Go to the next carbon. If I put a plus charge here, break this bond, is that a stable carbocation? Is nature happy with that? No, she's not. This carbon's sp2 hybridized. That's not a stable. That's the worst type of carbocation. She is not going to let that happen. Over here, however, is tertiary. Right? Talk to that carbon. Stash the one, two, three carbons. It's tertiary. Ooh, yeah, that's what's going to happen. This is going to go by an SN1 mechanism because one side of the ether is tertiary. The other options are allylic or benzylic. Okay, so what's the step? Well, SN1, first step is make the carbocation. We heat this up or just wait for a bond to break. It's this bond. These electrons flow onto oxygen. Oxygen is more electronegative. It's tugging on those electrons anyways. And it creates an alcohol group. And, well, if you're a visual learner, you might draw the right hand side of the ether like that, there's the carbocation. Or if you like to draw your molecules in their most common shape or more stable shape, you might straighten out the bonds and it's SP2 hybridized, the bond angle should be 120. That looks a little nicer. Your choice, however you wanna do it. Okay, that's the first step of SN1. What happens next? Well, check and see if it rearranges. Carbocation, nope, it's tertiary, should not rearrange. Nice. Finally, last step of SN1, opposites attract. The lone pair is gonna go negative uh, bromine, gonna attack the positive carbocation. And then if you're drawing it this way, you can. If you wanna draw it this way, just put the bromine anywhere attached to that carbon. The key point here, is that you're not going to make this molecule or this one. Okay, so that's where students make the mistake. They like to take a shortcut and they say, oh, this is acidic cleavage. You can take the butcher's cleaving knife and chop an ether in half. So I won't do the mechanism, I'll just predict products. So you can either cut this side or this side and if you choose the wrong side, you get no points because you got the wrong products. So that's SN1 mechanism. Knowing that will help you choose which side of the bend of the ether, which side of the ether you need to cut. All right, see another one. Oh, wait, one more idea. Remember back when we talked about SN1, we had our decision table. We had to figure out, you know, is SN1, SN2, E1 or E2 happening here? And one of the things we said is that SN1 and E1 usually happen together. If you have SN1, you probably are gonna have E1. Okay, not today. <laughs> More exceptions to patterns, sorry. Um, an E1 mechanism requires a weak base. Okay, and here, the only base we have is not a base. Bromide ion, like chloride ion, is not a base. So bromide, and if you use HI, iodide, not a base. So there is, so there is, no, there is no, that's the word I want, no E1 product or E1 mechanism. Cool. All right, let's do another one. Let's see what else I got. Looking, looking. Oh, okay. Let's use that one. Let's 
Let's use HI this time. Okay. Step one, let the strongest reagent go first. Lone parent ether is going to grab that strong <laughs> H plus from strong acid. We're going to protonate the ether. We have I minus, home pairs, might need those for the next part of the mechanism. Uh, what happens next? Well, this is secondary. It's not tertiary, it's not benzylic, it's not allylic. This is primary. Ooh, SN1, right? Ooh, careful. This primary carbon is right next door to a benzene ring. That makes it benzylic. And nature says, I like benzylic carbocations because they're resonance stabilized. So if I draw out the circle here and show my three pi bonds, put the plus charge here, you can actually roll this pi bond over to get a resonance structure. Start moving the plus charge around the ring. You make that alcohol and then iodides here. Benzylic carbocations, allylic, they should not rearrange because they're already resin stabilized. No reason to rearrange if you're stable. So no carbocation rearrangements. So have the iodide attack there. And what we have is a carbon linked to an iodide. And then we have our alcohol attached to the cyclohexane ring. Nice. Whoops, I wanna do one more. Okay, let's see, let's have there, that HBR. Okay, we got a different ether, strong acid, HBR, HI. Okay, the ether's gonna get chopped into two pieces. Where's the chopping happening? Run through the mechanism and let's find out. Okay, step one, protonate the ether. Did I lose any carbons? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Good, I'm good. And we get bromide ion as a product two after HBR attacks. Okay, what happens next? Well, check your carbons. Attach the oxygen on this side, it's primary. Attach the oxygen on this side, that's primary. Ooh, okay, it's not tertiary, not benzylic. It's not allylic. This is going to go by the SN2 mechanism. Cool. And they're both primary. So do we get a mixture? Right? So does the bromide attack this carbon kick out the oxygen? Or does it attack that one 50-50? To answer that question, what do you know about SN2? Well, let's see. SN1, SN1 makes carbocations and tertiary is the best. SN2. Tertiary is the worst. Why is tertiary so bad for SN2? You want to avoid crowding. SN2 prefers, prefers primary over secondary in no way much, much greater than tertiary. Too crowded. That's supposed to say crowded. <laughs> I know you can't read it because I can't spell it. So apply that knowledge here. Hey, SN2, you want to avoid crowding. So one of these primary carbons, which one's less crowded? The left primary carbon or the right primary carbon? The right one is less crowded. So that is where the cleavage attack occurs. Yep, less crowded. So even though it looks like it's tied, well, why are we even looking at primary? It's because SN2 likes primary the best because it's the least crowded. Well, keep going with that thought. Choose the least crowded carbon. And so now the oxygen stayed attached, that bond didn't break, but this one did. So break that bond. That looks like a double bond, a single bond. Okay, so break the right-hand side the left-hand side stays attached. The alcohol is now on the left side. 
and the bromide is now attached to where the alcohol used to be in one, two, three, four, five carbons. One, two, three, four, five carbons. Nice. Cool. We are done with acidic cleavage of ethers by HBr or HI. Let's look at that third acid, HBr, HI, and trifluoroacetic acid. We saw the trifluoroacetate in that oxymercuration demercuration reaction. Wow, everything's just all tying together. Trifluoroacetic acid is a powerful, very strong acid. So let's start with, I don't know, maybe this ether. And mix it with trifluoroacetic acid. Okay, so we got an ether, strong acid. Let the reaction, I mean, the most powerful reagent go for it first. Lone pair is going to grab that H plus. Protonates ether. Now we have this molecule, the trifluoroacetate molecule. Let's draw it. You don't have to do this on the exam or in the mechanism, but I think it will help if I draw it out. OK, this thing is stabilized by resonance. So the pi bond can move down here, flip flop, and put the negative charge on the other oxygen. So it's already resonance stabilized that way. And then what do you know about CF3? What kind of orthopara directing group is that? It's a meta director, yeah. It's a strongly deactivating group. And strong deactivate. So ethyl, we said earlier, activated oxygen to make it more basic. Ethyl is a weak activator. Meta directors are weak deactivate. De deactivators, it deactivates bases. So this negative charge is being siphoned off by the very electronegative fluorine atoms. The trifluoromethyl group is an electron withdrawing group, sucking away the electron density, making this oxygen and this oxygen even less negative, making it very, very stable. There you go. And if it's a very stable conjugate base, it's conjugate acid, it's going to be very reactive, very strong. It also makes it a very poor nucleophile and a poor base. It's just very stable, it doesn't really do anything. So what happens next? Well, it's gonna try and form a carbocation and it does so every time, that's the only option. Um, it's, not good, it's not a good nucleophile, so I know it's E1. Does an SN1 happen at the same time? Not here, another exception. It only goes E1. So E stands for elimination we can also remember it meaning ene. It's going to make an alkene. We're going to get an alkene product. OK, but E1 and SN1 go by carbocation. So let's do that first. This carbon of the ether is secondary. This carbon is tertiary. Tertiary is more stable as a carbocation. When it's, you know, carbocations are tertiary, are more stable than secondary. So this bond breaks. Sorry, the oxygen should have had a positive charge. Three bonds. So you make this alcohol. And if you want to draw the molecule that way, you can. Or if you want to straighten out the bonds, there's our carbocation. We still have trifluoroacetate. But we already said it's a bad base, bad nucleophile. It's not going to do anything. Instead, the lone pair on the alcohol is actually more basic than this oxygen. Crazy. And what are we doing? We're going E1, E1 mechanism, make some alkenes. So the oxygen can grab a hydrogen from the carbon adjacent the um, positive charge, remove H plus, and these bonding electrons then become the pi bond. And there's our alkene product. And of course, you could have made that double bond across these two carbons or across those two. Zaitsev's rule will help you figure out wh which alkene is the major product. It's the alkene with the most groups attached to it, the most substitute alkene. 
but there you go. That's the end of the product, I'm sorry, end of the mechanism. Um, in the lab, you would neutralize this with sodium, um, with baking soda, sodium bicarbonate, some mild base to remove this extra hydrogen. So your final products would be the alcohol and the alkene. Cool. Or you can dilute it with water. This will donate H plus to water. Okay, last reaction of ethers. It's an oddball. Um, again, ethers are just not very reactive at all. They react with HBr, HI, trifluoroacetic acid. And if properly set up, they can do this Claisen rearrangement. Okay, it, the mechanism looks really similar to Diels Alder. So let's review that in a minute to help us understand the mechanism of Claisen rearrangements. But first of all, the reaction only works if you have an ether that has a vinyl group on one side and an allyl, allyl, allyl <laughs> group on the other. Okay, so we have an ether and let's put a vinyl group on one side. So you take an alkene, connect it directly to the ether, alkene carbon. And allyl has three L's, so we have three carbons. One, two, three, and we don't connect the alkene carbon to the oxygen. The alkene is going to be over here. Okay, this is an allyl vinyl ether. That's a common name. However, this is the parent. So you can decorate this molecule and it can still do clays in the clays and rearrangement, right? So you can make the chain longer. You can make this longer. You can put groups on it stuff like that. And in its core is still an allyl vinyl ether. It still works. Okay, the other option is you swap out the vinyl for a phenyl, a benzene ring. So here's how I remember it. This is like the parent allyl vinyl. Let's put the double on this side. And now use this vinyl group to finish making a benzene ring. There you go, and that's the other thing. So at its core, it still is an allyl vinyl ether. And again, that's the parent, right? So if you have this molecule, and you see something like this, I don't know, whatever, this, this molecule still can do the clays and rearrangement. All right, so how does it work? Let's look at the deals all the reaction first. Because if we remember that mechanism from last semester, then we can do this mechanism of clays in much more easily. Okay. So what, for, what you needed for a deals alder is you needed a conjugated diene. So two pi bonds, and then there was a single bond in between, right? Double, single, doubles, conjugated. And you take another pi bond, an alkene or a alkyne, double or triple, and we call that the dienophile, right? File means seeking or loving. What does this molecule seek? It seeks the diene, it's gonna attack that thing. And then what does it make? Well, the way I remember it is that nature loves benzene. And if she could just close these gaps, that looks like benzene. And that's what she wants. So that's the mechanism. Let's try and close, let's connect these carbons together to close up the ring. Well. Why don't we just use the pi bond to do that? So starting with this pi bond or this pi bond, you choose how you close up this ring down here. Um, maybe I'll pick this one. Someone else might pick that one. Just roll it over. Either mechanism works. So we're going to move this pi bond here and connect these two carbons together. Yeah, but wait. This alkene already has 
full already has four bonds. There's two hydrogens there. So as this pi bond rolls over, it's trying to make a fifth bond. Can't do that. So this pi bond rolls out of the way and closes the bridge up here. Closes the gap. Cool. Um, but again, this carbon has four bonds already. So when this pi bond moves over to close the gap, that pushes this pi bond over here. Three arrows, one step, deals alter is done. What's the net outcome? Well, this pi bond became this single bond down here. This pi bond on the right became this single bond up here. Feel it in, it's a single bond. And then this pi bond rolled over and went here. You make, you didn't, sorry, nature, you don't get benzene out of this, you get cyclohexene. And the way students remember it is start with your diene, wherever the single bond is, that's where the double bond's going to end up. Nice pattern. Okay, that's the mechanism deals alder. Let's use it for the Claisen mechanism. Claisen rearrangement. And then we'll predict our products as we run through the mechanism. So let's say on the exam, you see, let's see this. And it just says heat. So I forgot to mention that the reagent, reagent in quotation marks, is heat. You need to mildly warm these up to get them to go. Okay, so what happens? Um, where's my other reagent? Um, this is weird. Thought you can't just have a molecule and just have it react by itself. So that's actually the, the sign. Um, that's a big clue. I think it's in chapter three, unit three. Unit three, that we see another reaction that only requires heat. So I believe by the end of organic chemistry, the full two semesters, I think there's only two reactions that just have heat. Okay, so that's going to be your biggest signal. So like aluminum chloride, AlCl3, only fuel craft reactions use AlCl3. So that's a big clue to help you identify the reaction. So if you just see heat, right now, the only reaction is Claisen rearrangement. Later, it's um, decarboxylation. We'll see you later. Okay, heat, that signals it's Claisen, the Claisen rearrangement. So think Deals alder and get these pi bonds to try and make benzene. What? <laughs> yeah. So what was it? We needed the allyl vinyl ether. Well, what we should do is rearrange this. So remember a confirmation analysis? Remember the chair confirmation of cyclohexane? We flipped, you know, flip the, we did a ring flip go from one chair to another, go into different shapes. So that's the first step of the mechanism. Um, or actually, you don't even have to include it. You just need to know to rearrange the molecule, not rearrange, uh, bend the molecule into a new shape. So um, single bonds are free to rotate. So why don't we just, and the idea is to try and make it look like a benzene ring. Try and get these pi bonds to resemble a benzene ring. So I'm gonna keep these two bi bonds together in the same spot, but now I want to go down to try and make a hexagon. So let's bend this double bond. Actually, nature would say spin about this bond so you can swing the pi bond down here. And do the same thing with this bond. Swing this group so it points down. And then I think this is already pointing in the right direction like that. There you go. So now we're starting to see kind of a cyclo, um, a hexagon, but oxygen is one part of the hexagon ring. It's not really looking like benzene so much, but pre pretend it is. <laughs> That's the key. Try and get a hexagon starting to form here. Now let's do the same thing with this. I know we already got a hexagon, but try and get a second one. Oh, this piece is too floppy. Let's try and bend it down. Well, let's see. If I look at this line and that line, Here's the pi bond. Here's a pi bond. So I want that pi bond part of my hexagon. So keep these together. And um, so what I want to do is move this bond 
this single bond downward. So let's first, first let's connect the oxygen to that carbon. And this is kind of my hexagon. Got a line here, a line there. And then this single bond, I'm gonna draw here. And then the double bond, I'm gonna draw down here. And now I'm starting to make a hexagon. Let's try one more time. See if I can draw a little more neatly. Sharper angles, make a little more clear. Okay. Draw here, here, there. There. Does that look more like a hexagon? If I close the gap right here, that would be a hexagon up here. So let's go with this drawing. Oh, finished benzene. Sorry. Okay. Um, you can begin your mechanism here. Just redraw this so that you can start to see a hexagon and say, okay, nature, you like benzene, so try and make benzene out of this. First, close up the ring. You can pick this pi bond or that pi bond. So I don't know, maybe I'll pick this one. So this one comes down to connect this carbon to that one. Oops, but this carbon already had four bonds, so it's gonna push this pi bond over there. And oops, oxygen already has two bonds. That's his preference, so this bond I know, it's not a pi bond, it's a single bond. It rolls over to here. And just like the DL's alder, you get, whoa. Yeah, go back up here. Just like the DL's alder, you get three arrows, one step. And trying to make cyclohexene, you get pi bond, you lose two pi bonds. So actually that's the same pattern. Just follow the pattern here. Try and make a benzene, close the gap, and use three arrows. Now track and see what those arrows are telling you. Um, there's no arrows on the rest of the benzene ring. So that stays constant. No changes there. This pi bond, that pi bond, nothing moved. But this pi bond left and doubled up the bond to the oxygen. Oxygen has single bond, but the pi bond moved there to make a double bond. Well, this bond up top left. And now this single bond took on another bond. It's now a double bond. And then this carbon and that one is connected here. The pi bond, though, moved from the end of the carbon to the, to the ring, what was the benzene ring. There we go. And that is our next intermediate. And you might ask yourself, well, am I done? Deals all there was one step and done. Well, clays and rearrangements sometimes are one and done. But ask yourself, is nature happy with this? Specifically, she started with a benzene aromatic ring, really stable. Does she still have an aromatic ring? No, no, she does not. She's not happy. This carbon is sp3 hybridized. And this other pi bonds outside the ring probably can't count it towards a huckle number. This is not aromatic. Nature, she says, give me back my aromatic ring. So check your product after doing the deals alder like mechanism. See if it's aromatic, if you started aromatic. If it's not, if you start aromatic and it's not aromatic, then you need to do one more step. You have to ask this oxygen to use this lone pair to grab that hydrogen. Should we do this in one step? No, we shouldn't do this one step. You have to ask the hydrogen to leave. We're gonna need, um, you need to breathe on this. <laughs> need to add some water or maybe some of the starting material, the ether, that oxygen has a lone pair. We will use water. Uh, water needs to come up here and you serve as a base to take away this H and restore the double bond and to the ring to make it aromatic, but then that's gonna push a pi bond up on the oxygen. So we're gonna get that pi bond from hydrogen's electrons and the oxygen's gonna go up here and get a third lone pair and be negatively charged. And the rest of this is still hanging out over there and we have the hydronium ion. And then finally, opposites attract. Negatively charged oxygen is going to grab the H plus. And 
And then we got our final product, which is aromatic. And don't lose your carbons. One, two, three, one, two, three, good. There's your product, a little bit of water. It's a callus, bring in a little water, little water leaves, you haven't used up any water. And there's your clays and rearrangement. Here, just last thing for this video, let's finish off this one. Um, actually, let's do a little bit different, a little different. Let's make the allyl vinyl ether a little differently. Let's say we have to predict the product of this clays and rearrangement, right? So it's got a vinyl ether, it's got an allyl ether, it's gonna work. Make it look like benzene is the first step. So I'm gonna keep these carbons the same and make my benzene ring right here. So go down. So I'm here. I went to here. And now I want to go in. So one, two, three. One, two, three. So this is my double bond. And it has a methyl group. Should I move the methyl group up here? What kind of double bond is that? Cis or trans? If I put the methyl group here, now my double bond is cis. But what was it? Trans, you gotta keep it trans. There we go. So to make this zigzag, I'm gonna have to put that group down. All right, keep going with the benzene ring. The other side of the ether, there's a carbon, then a double bond. Carbon, then a double bond. And then we have two methyl branches coming off of it. So let's do it like that. Cool. And now let's heat it up and try to make benzene. Okay, we have to close the gap. We have to connect these two carbons together. And unfortunately, if you draw this methyl group too close, you might accidentally use this bond to connect to that carbon. Yikes, there's a methyl group here. Yeah, don't use that bond the methyl group will get lost. You'll get the wrong answer. No, no, no. So what are we going to do? Let's push one of these pi bonds to close the gap between these two carbons. So I'm going to choose this one. And as that bond is forming, this pi bond has to roll over to here. And then oxygen had two bonds. And here comes a third one. So this bond leaves and goes here. Three arrows. And now track what they did. OK, let's start with the oxygen up top. And on the right side, now I have a double bond. That's what this arrow says, bring the pi bond here. Go down, it was a double bond, but now it's not. This downward bond has a single bond. And there's two methyl groups, good. Over here, don't connect an oxygen, that bond left to make a double bond here. So this, these two carbons are double bonded. Then connect to another carbon here, but it's not double bond anymore. At the end of this one is a methyl group here. And then finally, this pi bond closed the gap. There we go. And then did we start with something aromatic? No, there's no ring. So then we're done. This is the final product. And if you don't like the way this is drawn, you can zigzag it. So let's see, this is one, two, three, four, five carbons. So let's put the double bond over here and add one, two, three, four, five carbons. If this is carbon one, here's two. One, here's two with two methyls. Here's three with a methyl. Four, five with a double. The, these two should be the same molecule. Ah, long video. Hey, but we covered all of key concepts number one. It's a nice job. I'll see you in the next video.